All right, hi everyone. My name is Zach Olkin, and today we're going to be talking about the basics of breadboarding, a bit about proto boards, multimeters, and some of the tools you'll use for basic electronics prototyping in general. We're going to start with the breadboard here. The breadboard is a board that is used to electrically connect different components without needing to solder. Uh, for that reason, it makes it very easy to prototype different things and it makes it very easy to change components in and out. To use this resistor here, I've got the resistor and I can just plug it in uh, just like that. And now it's electrically connected to this button and this wire. Now the way breadboards work is that the horizontal lines here are the ones that are horizontally, that are electrically connected. So anything in this row, row like 25 here, is gonna be connected, but it's not connected to this side. This break in the center, this physical break, is also an electrical break. So the idea is that you can put stuff on this side and stuff on this side and have them not necessarily be connected. And then we've got the power rails. And this is where you're generally supposed to put your power and your ground. And these, instead of being, are connected horizontally, but they're also connected vertically. So the idea is that you can just put your power up here or down here or really wherever you want, and then it'll connect all the way up and down your breadboard. And then what I've got right here is I've got a battery. This is just your normal nine volt battery. And it's got one of these uh, sort of nine volt battery connectors on it. And these are really nice because they're very simple. They're very cheap. The Hive has a bunch of them. You can very easily just slap one onto a battery and then connect the battery up. And we're gonna use that here in a second. But when you're actually at the Hive or when you're using, um, potentially when you're doing more advanced electronics, if you have a power supply, you can use the power supply instead of a simple battery like this. And the power supply will allow you to get variable voltages and it will also potentially provide you with more current than something like this can. It is worth noting though that the power supplies cannot provide lots of current. So doing something like motor testing or motor stalling is not gonna be a good idea with power supply. Um, so instead of using a power supply, that's where you can use other batteries like this. If you're trying to work with something high current, you know, this is a LiPo battery. This guy here is an XT60 connector. The Hive has some of those. This guy's used for balance charging, uh, whatnot. You can do your research on LiPo batteries if that's what you want to use for your project. And then, of course, we've got uh, even bigger batteries like this guy. Honestly, not even sure what this goes to, but it is a battery, and it is something you could potentially use. So... We're gonna look at the circuit here, so let me first show you what it does. We plug this battery in, I'm just connecting the ground and the power supply, and this circuit connects the battery through a resistor into a button, into an LED, and it'll complete that circuit. So when I press the button, the LED turns on. Perfect, that's exactly what we want. So the way we did this here with the breadboard is we were able to put these all into the slots, this button here is got four prongs that might be a little hard to see, but two on the top and two on the bottom. These ones here in the top are electrically connected and same with the ones in the bottom. And then I can just push that in there. And then the idea is that when you press the button, it'll connect the top and the bottom. Then the LED itself also has two prongs, has two stems. One of them here is longer. That's the one that always goes on the power side. If you don't put that on the power side, it's not gonna function because it's not how diodes work. So you put the shorter one then connecting to the ground and just like that, this circuit is complete. The wire from the power to the resistor, resistor to button, button to LED, LED to ground. This takes you know only a few minutes to make on a breadboard, which is why you use these breadboards. Now the breadboard here, um, since it makes things really easy to prototype, some people call them proto boards. The ECE curriculum, I believe, also calls them protoboards. The name is sort of interchangeable. The reason that could become an issue, though, is when someone wants a board like this. Uh, lots of people will also call this a protoboard. So if you're not sure what someone wants, just clarify. If they want something like this or something as a breadboard. The key difference here is that this is not solderless. You do need to solder to get those connections. So this specific one has no connections between any horizontals or verticals. Some do. So if you look at the board, you should be able to see if there's a metal connection between the holes. That'll tell you if there is um, an electrical connection. And so with this one, if you want to use it, you just take your resistor, your components, you put them in the holes, 
and then you solder. This is just a wire solder, soldered on, but that's the idea, right? And then you can place your entire setup onto one of these proto boards. Uh, the beauty of these proto boards over this breadboard is that these will be these will last longer uh, because they're soldered on. Components won't fall out, but of course it's going to take much longer to use these. So most people will just prototype on a breadboard, and then if you want something a little bit more permanent, you can move your prototype from the breadboard to the proto board. And then of course, if you want something even more permanent, you can use a PCB, uh, custom PCBs. Then. The multimeter. The multimeter is extremely useful for debugging and just for measuring almost anything you can think of. The multimeter looks uh, looks like this. There's a display up here, and then there's this sort of knob to tell you what or to select what you want to measure. Uh, the Hive itself has also uh, benchtop multimeters. Those are going to be a little bit higher quality, and they're not going to look quite like this. But the idea is the same. The Hive also has handheld ones like this uh, by Fluke, and Fluke is a pretty pretty high quality multimeters, so those are good to use. We've got, you just move this dial and then you can select. So we've got DC voltage, AC voltage, resistance, connectivity, capacitance, and um, many other things if you wanna measure them. So to use the multimeter, it's got two probes, normally a red and a black. And the idea here is that, say, if I want to measure the voltage of this battery, which is pretty new, so I expect it to be right around 9 volts, I can just go over here and I can just measure like this. Uh, it might be hard to see, but okay, that's at, yeah, 9 volts, pretty much exactly. And so it's just as easy as that to measure the battery. If you swap the two, then your voltage will come out negative. So you just gotta, you know, be careful about which, which probe you're putting where. Uh, you can measure things like resistance. Uh, that'll tell you many ohms. So right now, infinite resistance, they're not connected. Put them together, you should get a number zero or very close to it. This one here will tell you if something is connected or not. So the beauty behind this is that it's really good for debugging. You can just sort of put these two probes together. You can check if any of these holes are connected. None of these holes are connected, so we shouldn't be told that. And it'll tell you that it's connected through a beeping sound. Um, you don't hear anything, because it's not. And then you put them together, it's connected, so it beeps. So whenever I solder something, then I always go to the adjacent sort of hole or adjacent solder joint and check. So in this case, the solder joint is not shorting with anything else, so we're good, we're set. But if it did beep like this, then it would tell you your solder joint is shorting with something you probably don't want it to be shorting with. So I always suggest to use that feature when you are soldering. All right, we're gonna look at this circuit now. This circuit's slightly more advanced. It's using a uh, digital chip here. This chip is in the DIP format, so dual inline package, because it's got two lines of uh, metal pins here. The idea behind this package is that you can just set it um, right into the breadboard. The issue though, is if you set it into the breadboard like this one here, since the breadboard connects horizontally, these pins are now connected horizontally, and that's not good um, because you oftentimes don't want those pins connected with each other as they all serve their own function. So that's why we use the center brake that I mentioned here, because this is also an electrical brake. So the, pin, the chips will fit uh, right into these two rows of pins two rows of holes, and then you can just plop it in and each row on the side corresponds to one pin only. There are other types of pins, uh, other types of packages. This one here, you could tell sort of flat, and then I soldered it onto an adapter. I would not suggest doing this. I'd suggest just finding the pin that you want, the chip that you want and the package you want it in. What we've got here, since I don't have a power supply, like I mentioned, with variable voltage, I've just got my battery. I actually had to make a little 9 volt to 5 volt adapter. That's what this chip here does. And then there's some capacitors to sort of smooth it out. Um, it's not fully connected right now, which is why nothing's happening. Um, but just know that's up there, and that's you know one of those things you can build easily with the breadboard. And then I'm taking advantage of the power rails. I've got my switches here. Uh, connected on power on ground and that goes all the way down and then I've got a little sort of connection over here so that I can also use this other rail. Uh, this is just a little 3D printed case I have to connect 
my switches so I can just easily switch them on and off. And then this is mobile so I can just move to another breadboard if I so choose and test another circuit. So this uh, chip right here is a four input AND gate and I've just um, pulled one of these pins high so it effectively is functioning as a three input AND gate because I only have three switches with me right now. The switches are connected into the pins of the AND gate and the voltage is connected to the AND gate and the ground is connected to the AND gate and then we've got a signal going to the LED. If you don't know what the pinout for this AND gate is, you can always look it up. There's little number letter combinations here, uh, which can be read and could even be memorized. And then you can just look those up and you can find online data sheets that'll tell you what the pinout is, what the maximum voltage is, what the you know desired voltage is, uh, things like that. And this is an AND gate. So what that means is that only when all three inputs are high is this LED gonna light up. So we can, we can actually now connect up the battery. Uh, give me one second to do that. And when we connect up this battery, if we can get these pins in there, we can now um, flip, the, uh, flip the switches. So now all three switches are high, so the LED is going high. If I switch one back, it's not gonna work. Uh, and you can do that with any of these combinations here. Uh, you can see that, yeah, they're all pointing the same direction. You flip it the other way, it's not gonna work. You flip it back. Perfect, uh, that's exactly what we wanted it to do. We've got the LED that can turn on and off with the three input and gate effectively. And then if you have issues, you can always use the multimeter to try to debug, check if you have any shorts and other things like that. So these are some basic electronics that you can make and use with the breadboard. Um, some things you can sort of prototype and use. And then I'll also show you one other important thing you can do and should do with the breadboard is when you're working with microcontrollers, like this right here is a Teensy. Uh, the Teensy pinout looks like this. Um, it's just got a bunch of pins that you can program and you can use. The idea here is that this guy is designed to fit right into the breadboard. So. What I've done is I've already programmed it to move this servo to make the servo rotate. And what I'm just gonna do is I'll plug it in to give power. And you can see that the servo is rotating. Uh, this is being powered off of my computer, so we don't need an external power supply, um, like a benchtop power supply or a battery. And then with just a few jumper cables, you can connect up to the servo and make the servo run. And then we can see here, if I pull this Teensy out of the breadboard, you can see that it's a very similar uh, pin out here. It's just a set of pins that have been soldered into the board that just fit directly into the breadboard. Uh, then just a few things on best practices. When you're using a uh, breadboard, you generally want to keep your wires close to the breadboard. That'll just keep everything um, much cleaner. These here that stick up, the only reason I'm doing that is because this is a uh, modular device and I wanna be able to move it um, all around. But this is much cleaner than a bunch of these. So if I start to take a few of these, right, and if I plug this guy in from here to here, you know, I'm not actually making it function, but if I wanna get to this resistor, this LED, this wire is in my way. And then you can only imagine if you get a bunch of wires if you have a very complicated thing you're prototyping this just becomes very complicated and then along that note you also want to try to color code i don't have quite the variety of colors i would like to have but what i've got right here is yellow and orange are generally power i've got blue and or sorry blue and purple here are ground this brown is a signal wire and that way you can you know look at the wires quickly and sort of see what they do Ideally, like these would all be red or something, or these would all be black, and that would all be ground, but I don't have those wires with me. So that's the basics of breadboarding, protoboards, a little bit about multimeters, a little bit about best practices, um, and a little example here. So thanks for watching.